we've spent some time looking at different aspects of wireless transmission and, and after some examples we have arrived at some model for how the signal is transmitted or how we can relate the transmit and receive power. We think we transmit a signal with some power, PT. The antenna, compared to an isotropic antenna, introduces some gain, denoted as GT at the transmitter and GR at the receiver. We can find out uh, in the same way the transmit and receive antenna. And importantly, between the antennas, as the signal propagates, there's attenuation. Across the path between transmitter and receiver, we lose some power. We denote that as the path loss, or L. So if we start with a transmit power of PT, the antennas introduce some gain, effectively amplify the signal. We multiply by GT and GR, and the loss is how much we reduce the signal strength by so that we divide by the loss factor, L in that case. So we get a relationship between those factors, which is useful for uh, answering some practical questions in wireless transmission or design of wireless networks, like how far can I transmit under certain conditions? One of our examples from yesterday was, could we transmit using our wireless access points from my house to my friend's house? If we know something about the characteristics of the transmitter, such that the transmit power, the characteristics of the receiver, such as the minimum power it can successfully receive, if we know the antennas and the gains of those antennas, then we can find how much loss we can tolerate between two points. And the next things of, of value is that there are some models that determine for a given amount of loss what distance does that correspond to? And we used what's called the free space path loss model. Out in space, no obstacles, no impacts from the atmosphere. If we transmit a signal wirelessly, how far will it travel? Or what's the relationship between the distance and the loss? Well, it's given by this equation. If we transmit a signal d meters, and the signal has a wavelength of lambda, then we can calculate the loss, L, from this equation. So that gives us some relationship that we can use in the previous equation. If we know PT and PR, we know GT and GR. If we know the distance, we can calculate the loss, or given the loss, find the distance, is what we did in one of the previous examples. We can do it in the, the absolute values, which is this equation and the, and the free space path loss model, or we can convert everything to dB. Why convert everything to dB? Because it allows us to do addition and subtraction as opposed to multiplication and division. Sometimes it's easier, and if you look up the specs of equipment, often the values are expressed in dB. So sometimes it's easier to convert. The other thing that we've seen is that we also have an equation that allows us to calculate antenna gain. If we go back a few slides, antenna gain, if we know the effective area, this one. If we know the effective area of the antenna and the wavelength of the signal we're transmitting, we can calculate the gain of that antenna. And the effective area is related to the physical area. And we'll, we'll see a couple more examples of that today. So let's summarize on the remaining slides and then just go through one more example relating antenna gain, path loss together. We are going to use, or we have in one example and we will again today, use this free space path loss model. It assumes perfect conditions. It doesn't apply if we're transmitting a signal indoors, for example. If we have an access point at the back of the room and I have my laptop in another room, then if we try and determine the amount of loss between those two points, we shouldn't use this model. It's not accurate. It's only accurate if we're out in space with no other effects, which is not never the case, but this is an easy one to calculate.
It's a good starting point. There are more complex models that try to relate distance with loss in different environments. We will not present them, but some of their names are listed here. For example, there are mathematical models that say if you transmit a signal through a city over D meters, how much path loss are you going to have? Or if you're a TV station and you transmit from your TV station tower to the TVs at people's homes, there are models to determine how much path loss occurs across different distances. And even there are models for indoor. I indoor, we have a problem with walls and other obstacles. So especially walls, if we have an access point at the back and my laptop's in the next room, the signal propagates through the air but then it hits the wall, what happens then is that the signal attenuates by a lot more than when it was propagating through the air. You think it's propagating through the air, it's getting weaker, it hits a wall and it jumps right down, it gets very weak. It goes through the wall but very weak and propagates a bit more until it gets to the receiver. So this free space path loss model doesn't capture how much power we lose due to walls and other obstacles. There are other mathematical models that try to do that. We will not see them today. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll see them in this course. We've gone through one example yes, yesterday about the Wi-Fi path loss. We'll see another one shortly. The remaining slides are just a few examples of different wireless technologies. But I think you know them already. We've mentioned some of them. You use some of them. Satellite communications, satellite TV. You may have a receiver at home, a dish that uh, picks up the TV broadcast from a satellite where the TV station sends us the TV signal up to the satellite and the satellite sends down. Everyone who has a receiver within the footprint of that satellite can receive that signal. So that's a point to multipoint. One transmits, multiple receive. So that's one application of satellite communications. Another one is positioning. What's the acronym or for positioning that we use for satellites? How do you find your position? GPS, Global Positioning System. So that uses a, a, a series of satellites in space and they send signals and your phone picks up the signal and from multiple signals you can triangulate and calculate where you are, the coordinates. So that's another application. Some companies may have a private network. Say you have your office in Bangkok and another office in LA in the US. You want a link between those two offices. Well, you can access the internet and use the, the submarine cables and so on or you can have a dedicated link by renting access to a satellite. You send from an antenna on the roof of your office here in Bangkok up to a satellite and that sends your data down to the office in the US. So that's like a private link using satellite communications. And you can sub subscribe to internet satellite, uh, internet access via satellites in, in different cases, especially if you're in remote areas. Maybe there's no ADSL, there's not good mobile phone coverage, so maybe your only option is to use satellite internet access. One of the companies that is, is quite popular in the Asian region, Southeast Asia, Australia, the Pacific, is IPSTAR. So, well that's the service. Uh, it's a Thai, run by a Thai company, what, Thaicom, have several satellites and they provide internet access. So IPSTAR is the service that they provide. On the website, I think there are a few slides that give the specs of the satellites, but we'll not cover them uh, today. We'll return a little bit to satellite and, and space communications in our example today. There are many other types of wireless technologies. Terrestrial wireless means the two points, one is not in space, they're both on the ground. Okay, so uh, an example is that on at this campus, on the other building, we have some antennas at the top of the building and one of them is pointing to one of our buildings at the Rungsit campus. That's a terrestrial wireless link between our two campuses. So covering that 12 or 15 kilometres, we have a wireless link that we use uh, to send data between our two campuses. 
There are different technologies available to do that, and you get different speeds. WiMAX is one of them. There, there are others. You know about mobile phones. They use different frequencies. How do they work? You use a, a base station or a cell phone tower, and you send wirelessly from your phone to that cell phone tower, and then via wires from the cell phone tower out to the rest of the network. The range or the distance that the transmissions uh, occur are typically in the order of hundreds of meters to kilometers. So one cell phone tower covers, say, a, about a circular area of a, maybe a kilometer, a radius of a kilometer. It differs in different cases. And then that's why you see many cell phone towers to cover the entire city of Bangkok. You need to have many cell phone towers to cover all the little pockets or all the little areas. Uh, maybe several kilometers in some cases. And I think you know about the data rates you can achieve with internet access via mobile phones. And Wi-Fi is another example of wireless technology. And we had a, a, a reasonably detailed example yesterday about Wi-Fi. And we may see some more as we go through this course. So that's the end of the slides. Let's just have one more example on antenna gain path loss and, and relating those factors together, just to give you some practice. And the example we'll use is an example of space communications. An example of communicating from Earth to Mars. Okay, so NASA has some, some spacecraft on Mars and also orbiting around Mars. This is a selfie that the Mars Curiosity rover took. It's a, a vehicle on Mars, it's there now, and it has some cameras on it. And I think this is a picture it's taken multiple times of itself. And there's no one else to take a photo of it on Mars. So this rover is on Mars, and it sends the photos back to Earth so we can see them. So we would like to look at a, a little bit about, well, the communications between Earth and Mars. How does it work, especially with respect to path loss? Yeah. Sorry? By light, in fact, there are different ways. It just uses normal electromagnetic waves. We'll see frequencies of around 8 gigahertz is one, but there's different options. So this Mars rover, just a vehicle on Mars, needs to go for several years. It's been there, I think, for two years already. It can't plug into a charger to charge its battery, so it must conserve power. And to transmit signals back, a common way that it transmits signals back is not sending it all the way back to Earth, but NASA has another spacecraft orbiting around Mars. has several, in fact. One of them is this, it's hard to see there, but there's a spacecraft that orbits around Mars called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And one role of this spacecraft is that the rover on Mars sends a signal up to the spacecraft and that relays it back to Earth. This spacecraft have, has bigger antennas and can transmit better than the, the rover. So in fact what we will look at in our example is how do we communicate between Earth and this orbiter that spacecraft's orbiting around Mars. So this one sends a signal back to Earth. Where do we receive it and where do we transmit from? There are some big dishes at different locations that NASA has. One in, I think, in California, one in Spain, one in Austra <coughs> Australia. They have several dishes like this. Large parabolic antennas. Remember? Larger the antenna, larger the gain. Further we can transmit. This one, I think, is... This one, or, or another one, is a diameter of 34 meters. The one we will use is a diameter of 34 meters. Same shape as your satellite TV antenna, but just bigger. So, we want to look at a scenario. If we want to transmit from Earth, using such an antenna, transmit up to the orbiter, or to the orbiter going around Mars, how much power do we need to transmit with? That's what we'd like to know. So to analyze that, we need to know some of the specs of the transmitter. 
and the receiver, and I'll give you them. And the details I'll write down, but if you want to read about them and find the specs and pictures of this equipment, I have it on a website linked from our course that talks about how we communicate from Earth to the, the rover on Mars. And it goes through some of the technical details of the distance between Earth and Mars, the different spacecraft near Mars or that have been used, and for the different spacecraft, the antennas, the transmit power, receive power, and other characteristics. But to save some time today, I'll just, I've grabbed some numbers from there already and we'll use them in our example. How far between Earth and Mars? It varies. The orbits of the two planets mean that they, the distance between them changes over, over the year or over time. We would not need all of these details, so if it's, it's a bit hard to read, don't worry. Don't try and copy it down. I'll show you what we need in a moment. But if Earth is here and we have our ground station, our big 34 metre parabolic dish, sending to the orbiter, MRO, here, and that's about several hundred kilometres above Mars, and then our rover, that vehicle, is on Mars and they communicate using UHF usually. We're going to focus on the link transmitting from our ground station on Earth to the orbiter near Mars. What's the distance? It ranges between 100 million kilometres to 400 million kilometres. So it depends upon the time of the year as to how far apart they are. Let's put a number to that. Let's assume some value. Let's assume it's about 250 million kilometres. So the numbers I write down we will need for our example. Let's say the distance is 250 million kilometres. That's the one we'll use. We're focusing on this part from the ground station on Earth to the orbiter in Mars or around Mars. That, that's the link that we're interested in. I'll give you some specs of the equipment, the transmitter and receiver. First, how do they communicate? They send a signal of a, with a particular center frequency. The band of frequencies is called the X-band. In space or satellite communications, there are a different range of frequencies available. There's L-band, C-band, X-band, KA, KU, and, and a few others. I've looked up the details for X-band, and in particular for transmitting to the, the orbiter, and the frequency used is about 7 gigahertz. Remember, Wi-Fi is 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. This transmits at a frequency of, to be more precise, 7 0.183 gigahertz. That's our signal frequency when we transmit. In fact, transmitting up is this frequency, transmitting down is closer to 8 gigahertz. They use different frequencies in each direction. Why am I writing them down? We need to know something about distance to work out path loss. And also path loss depends upon the, the wavelength or frequency, so we'll need those values shortly. How big is the antenna on Earth? The radius, I write R, it's a 34 meter diameter dish, so the radius is 17 meters. So the radius of the dish is 17 meters. We know something about, based upon the size of an antenna, we can calculate the gain of that antenna. If we go back, one of our equations we had, this one. The gain of an antenna depends upon the wavelength. Well, we know the frequency. And also depends upon the effective area. 
And this is something that de differs depending upon the construction of the, of the antenna. The effective area is usually uh, smaller than the actual or the physical area. For a dish, we can think the physical area is about that of a circle. If we look front on, it's a circle. So the physical area is about pi r squared. We know the radius is 17 meters, so we can find the physical area. The effective area is some fraction of the physical area. And I looked up the specs for this antenna that in the, the NASA system, and in this case it's about 0 0.8 times the physical area. That is, the effective area, AE, is 0 0.8 not 0 0.5, like in the previous example, times the physical area, A. And the physical area is simply pi r squared. So we can find that. We know r, the radius. So here's a hint. You can use these values to find the gain of the transmitting antenna. What about the receiving antenna on the spacecraft orbiting around Mars? It has a 3 meter antenna. And I, again, I looked up the specs about the, um, the efficiency. And in fact, to make it a bit easier for us, I looked up the gain. And it tells us the gain was 45.2 dBi. The receiving antenna has a gain of 45.2 dBi. The transmitting antenna has a gain that you'll need to calculate in a moment from the values given. So we know something about the gains of the both antennas. We know something about GT and GR. We know the distance we need to cover. Given the distance, we can calculate the loss in free space. How? Using this model. If we know the distance and the wavelength, we can find the loss, L. Another characteristic of the receiver is what's the minimum power it can successfully receive. It's called the receiver sensitivity, PR, or the minimum PR. And I looked up, and it, it varies for different data rates. It has different values, but the one we'll use, PR minus 100 dBm. What that means is if from Earth we transmit a signal and it's received eventually after the gain of the receive antenna, if the receive power is greater than minus 100 dBm, we can successfully receive. If it's less than minus 100 dBm, then we cannot receive. And we can't talk to our orbiter, and we can't control or talk to our Curiosity rover. So that's the, what we call the receive sensitivity. It's the cutoff. Above there is OK, below is not OK. So we want to find out at what power should we transmit at? such that we receive at this level. What's PT? How much power do we need to transmit such that we can receive a signal at minus 100 dBm? There's your challenge for the next 10 minutes or so. Try and do those calculations and find PT. And the hints? find the gain of the transmitter antenna first. And for that, you'll actually need the wavelength. And then you can use your equations to find PT. And another hint, note that some values are in dB. Some you'll get in the absolute values. I suggest convert them all to dB where possible. It will be easier at the end. Try that for the next 10 minutes. Try and calculate on your own, ask any questions, and then we'll, we'll go through the answer. We need the gain of the transmit antenna to, 
to be able to find eventually the, the transmit power. We know the radius of the antenna is 17 meters, so we can find the physical area is pi r squared. And then we said the effective area is 0 0.8 times the physical area, not 0 0.5 in this case. It differs in different antennas. 0 0.8 times pi r squared will give us AE. If we know AE, if we can find the wavelength, the speed of light divided by the frequency, then we can find G. Let's do that. We'll need the wavelength. The speed of light, 3 by 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Frequency, 7.183 gigahertz by 10 to the power of 9. We could leave it like that and calculate later, but let's find the wavelength. Three by ten to the power of eight divided by seven point one eight three times ten to the power of nine. Point oh four one seven six. Now we need we should be careful when we calculate steps and then uh, round the numbers or approximate. We should actually save this actual number. I shouldn't write it as 0 0.04 or even 0 0.041. I should save the actual number so we're a little bit more accurate. But sometimes we can, let's say, let's say it's 0 0.0418. Just so it's easy for me to write. meters, the wavelength. The area of that, sat, of that transmitting dish, pi r squared, we said the radius was 17 meters, pi times 17 squared. The effective area is 0 0.8 times that, where 0 0.8 was given. I will not calculate yet because we use that in the gain equation. The gain of our transmit antenna, 4 pi AE divided by lambda squared. AE is 0 0.8 pi times 17 squared divided by our lambda squared. Now we need our calculator. <coughs> 4 times pi times 0 0.8 times pi times 17 squared divided by 0 0.0418 squared. There's our gain of our transmit antenna, about 5.2 million. That is our big 34 meter dish parabolic antenna compared to our standard isotropic antenna this one is 5.2 million times stronger. If we measure the receive power at the same distance from those two antennas, if it was one watt for an isotropic antenna, it would be 5.2 million watts if we use our actual uh, parabolic dish antenna. Now, it's going to be easier if we do the last calculations in dB. So let's convert it to dBi. Simply Take the logarithm times by 10. I will not write that down, but instead log of that times by 10 
67 dBi. We should be accurate here, in fact. Again, I shouldn't round too much because, especially on dB, a small difference is quite significant because it's a long, on a logarithmic scale. So I'll write it down as 67.18 dBi. 67.18. That's the gain of our transmit antenna. I've given you the gain of the receive antenna. It's 45.2 dBi. What's next? The loss. We know GT, we know GR, we know PR, we want to find PT, so there's another thing missing at the moment, L. If we can find L, we can find PT. How do we find the loss? Well, we have another equation here. The loss in free space and Sending a signal out to Mars is as close as we'll get in real life to free space. The loss is 4 times pi times the distance. The distance in metres divided by the wavelength, all squared. So we can calculate that easily. The distance is the 250 million kilometres. Four times pi times the distance, 250 million kilometers, which is 250 times 10 to the power of what? How many meters? 250 by 10 to the power of 6 kilometers, or 250 by 10 to the power of 9 meters. That's a 9. Divided by our wavelength. Well, we have that. and square all of it. So be careful when the distance is given in kilometers, convert it back to meters if you want to use it in this free space path loss equation. Four times pi times 250 times 10 to the power of 9 divided by 0 0.0418 to the power of 2, all squared. We transmit a signal. You can think if the signal comes out of the big dish antenna, comes out at this level, then it travels 250 million kilometres when it comes into the receive antenna at the orbiter near Mars, it is this many times weaker. 5 by 10 to the power of 27 times weaker than what was start, we started with. Signal attenuates by this factor over that distance, that very long distance. Convert to dB. Take the logarithm times by 10. It will be easier in the next step. And again, using dB is easier because instead of thinking of 5.64 by 10 to the power of 27, logarithm times 10, we get 277.52 dB. That's the loss in this case. we know from this equation in the dB form. The receive power equals the transmit power plus the gain of the transmit antenna plus the gain of the receive antenna minus the loss across the path. 
where all those are expressed in their DB form. Well, that's what we have. We know GT, we just calculated to be, what, 67. We know GR, I told it was 45.2 dBi. We just calculated the loss to be 277 dB. And I also said that the received sensitivity was minus 100 dBm. So we know four of the five variables. The one we want is PT, so we can rearrange to find PT. Take that equation and rearrange to find PT. I will not write the subscript of DB. They're all in DB form. If you rearrange, it becomes PR minus GT minus GR plus the loss. PR, we said PR was minus 100 dBm. GT, I gave you as 45.2 dBi. We calculated GT to be what, 67.18? So we know those three, and we also found the loss. Across this long distance, we lose by a factor of 277 point, whatever it was, 51 dB. So plug those four values into our equation. Minus 100 dBm. Minus, or was it 67 point, what was the value? I'll look up if no one will tell me. 67.18 dBi minus 45.2 dBi for the receiver and the loss 277.52 I wrote 51 here 52 plus what do you get? minus 100 minus 67.18 minus 45.2 plus 277.52 is 65.14 Think of G, T, G, R, and L as having no units. Well, the units is dB, but they are dimensionless. P, R is measuring power level, milliwatts in this case. So P, T, we have the same units as P, R, dBm. If P, R was in dBw, P, T would be in dBw, but it's in dBm. And if we want to convert back to the absolute values, 65.14 dBm, how many milliwatts? Or well, 10 to the power of that number divided by 10. Remember to go in the opposite direction, we, don't, we had 10 log, 10 times log the power, or the, the ratio, to so go backwards we have the ratio divided by 10 and then 10 to the power of. Is that many milliwatts? DBM said milliwatts. Convert to watts. Divide by a thousand. 3,266 watts.
so what we've arrived at at the end is how much power we must transmit at on Earth such that the signal with the two antennas we're using and that very large amount of loss across the 250 million kilometers, the signal received is at least or is equal to our threshold or our received sensitivity of minus 100 dBm. So if we transmit at this, then we should receive at minus 100 dBm and our receiver can understand. If we transmit it larger than this, 3,300, 4,000 watts, then the received power will also be larger than the sensitivity and they'll receive the signal. But if we transmit it at lower, at 3,000 watts, the received power would be less than minus 100 dBm, it would be lower than the sensitivity, and the receiver at the Mars uh, orbiter would not be able to understand the signal. So we need at least this many watts to transmit it. 3,000 watts, 3,266. Luckily, I've looked up the specs of the ground station and it goes up to the maximum transmit power is 20 kilowatt, kilowatts. So our calculation says we require to transmit at 3.2 kilowatts, but that ground station can go up to 20 kilowatts, so it's okay. It's within the limits of the, the transmitter. The transmitter can usually change the power. So we can communicate from Earth to our uh, orbiter going around Mars.